So I'm very happy to be behind. Uh, in, I'm, I realize I'm only like 30 slides out of 90 slides or something. But I'm, I don't know. I'm happy to go, as, to go through without, I don't like to dismiss any questions. Uh, so let's just, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna keep going. At some point when we're approaching the end, I may speed through things. Everything I'm talking about I think is published, some, most of it relatively recently. So, if, so I feel like if, you, if we don't get to something, then you, you, can, you can look it up. I, I don't remember which paper I gave for the, for the course, but, but I think you can find it fairly easily. Okay, so let me start by summarizing what we were talking about um, up till now. So uh, what we find is it's that activating serotonin neurons is, is, at least in the open field, neither positively or negatively reinforcing. I, we have several other experiments that, that's, that we've tried, actually more than, several, like, uh, more than a few. We, we, we still have never seen anything that looks like positive or negative reinforcement. At least we, we are quite convinced that, that this is not what's going on, but I would say we can never be 100% uh, certain. But we see that serotonin activation causes a rapid and transient inhibition of locomotion in the open field, which we call a direct effect, and it causes a long-lasting facilitation of locomotion, which I'm calling a learning effect. What I think is a key experiment for that that we were, a couple of us were discussing is to, to distinguish whether it's something like a, for example, if there was some uh, uh, regulation of receptors at the RAFE level, so say because of 1A receptor feedback, there was some downregulation process, that would be not really learning because it would be global and affecting whatever, whatever you did, whatever behavior, et cetera versus, say, something that's interacting with a learning process that has to do with the specific thing that the animal has been doing while we stimulate. And in order to, d to distinguish those, it would be very interesting to know if, if, you, if you stimulate the animal in task A and then for 20 days stimulate it in its home cage or in task B and then bring it back to task A, is there some effect or, or not? Does it transfer between contexts, which would suggest something more global, like a auto-regulation, receptor internalization, et cetera? Or is it interacting with learning mechanisms that would be, tend to be more specific for, for what, uh, what we were doing? Say, well, I'll get back to it at the end, but this two to three week thing is kind of interesting because serotonin reuptake inhibitors have this classic two to three week time window that, that they typically take to, to have effects. So is that related to this two to three weeks or is it just a coincidence? Uh, certainly might be a coincidence, but I think the, the existence of a long lasting learning like effect from serotonin is a is a very important issue to nail down and there's there's evidence out there that that this may be going on and and we think that that's really important to chase down okay so the biggest problem with this work that i've shown you i would say is that it's really hard to interpret changes in locomotion in the open field because the animal is running around for reasons that we have very little insight into. We don't know what it's seen. We don't know why it's deciding one thing or the other. To a limited degree, we could interpret whether it goes to the wall or in the center as anxiety or, or something like that. And as I, I said, we don't see any effect on that, but it's fairly weak. So we, we generally prefer tasks which uh, try to isolate a particular function and then see whether that particular function is, is affected. The, the, the advantage is also the disadvantage. If we do such a task, then we're pretty dependent on making a good guess about what, what, what the function is, and all we learn is that that particular function can be affected. So it doesn't mean that other functions are not, right? So there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing perfect. But we, we, one thing that we've followed um, 
been following is an observation uh, that a lot of the, the work that drew us to this kind of task was from Kenji Doya's lab. And Kenji Doya has, is actually more of a theoretical computational neuroscientist, but he, they also do experiments, and he's also interested in serotonin. He originally had proposed, um, well, it, it, he, he's been interested in the idea that serotonin has something to do with temporal discounting or patience. So they, they've used a task very similar to this, a little bit different, but I'm just gonna explain our version of it. And it, it, we call it a waiting task. And basically the animal has um, a, two ports. One is, a, their, their nose pokes. One is for waiting, that's this one. And one is for um, getting water rewards. And we make the animal wait for a tone, which signals that it's okay to go. And we delay the tone using a random uh, distribution of intervals that, that follows this distribution. So it's highly unpredictable from trial to trial. Sometimes the animal will only have to wait half a second, and other, time, other trials it will have to wait six seconds. As an aside, we, used, we, we published a couple papers using a slightly different, but pretty much the same task with rats. And it turns out that mice are, if anything, a little bit better at this task than, than rats are. So, you, yeah, it goes without, I haven't really mentioned much, but my lab traditionally always worked on rats. We, we only started mice in order to do these serotonin experiments. And we found no problems getting mice to do all the things that, that we, could, we could do with rats, except uh, surviving, having a lot of electrodes plant, implanted in their head. Is a, is a key advantage of, of rats. Okay, so, so they do this, and if they pull out before the tone goes off, then they're impatient, and they don't get any reward. If they wait successfully until the tone, then uh, as long as they respond within a reasonable time, about a second, then they get a reward, and we call that a patient trial. So what serotonin does in this, I'll just show you this and then, what serotonin, it's very, just one slide. What serotonin does, and this is an example of a dose response curve, is if you, the more you stimulate, the more their average uh, successful waiting trials or their average amount of time they're, they're willing to wait uh, increases. So here's three different laser powers, which essentially determines how, what fraction of cells are being stimulated. And, uh, f one, two, three, four different uh, stimulation rates from one hertz to 25 hertz. And so at, at very low amplitudes, we don't see anything. As we go up to more cells, a larger amplitude, we start to see an effect. And at five milliwatts, which is now what we typically would use, we see a nice graded effect increasing with, with with stimulus frequency. So this is the type of experiment that I'm referring to when I say we always sort of see fairly linear effects. So what happened if we went up to 50 hertz or 100 hertz? We haven't really done that much, so maybe it goes down again. But we don't see any signs of this typical effect being on the you know, downside of something else. You know, we, don't, we don't see an opposite effect in the in these low stimulation regimes. So if there is a U in this case, it's probably above where we are, we think. As I was curious, what, do they have a fixed number of trials, or do they have an amount of time that is in we fix, we fix the interval between trials. So they don't, they don't go any fast. If they go faster, they don't they still have to wait as much for the next trial to begin. But could they get more if they end the trial sooner? They still have to wait, but do they have, so they have a fixed number of trials? Because uh, yeah. if they have a fixed time, then they might, if they end sooner, they might get more trials. No, they, don't, they can't get more trials. But at some level, you could, well, we, you can do it either way, but it, 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 it's, uh, it, in this case, it's fixed. So they, they don't really benefit by being less patient. In other words, like the, the animals, despite not benefiting, uh, still are impatient. You know, they, they even if they want to go faster, even though it 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 it, it doesn't benefit them. And what is it doing? Is it uh, is it the the average or how is it related to? Is it any related to meaningful related to the distribution? 
The, the distribution of the time during the infection. Oh, what the animals do when they give up? Uh, or what, what it's, I missed the, the, the... This maximum time that they're waiting, or the, the average time that they're waiting, uh, is it related in a meaningful way to distribution of intervals that you're presenting? Yes. Yes, you mean, well, you, you, so it, it looks, <clears throat> if you plotted the distribution of, of times that the animal waits or gives up in particular, it would actually resemble this distribution fairly closely. So they don't, they don't say pick a, a sort of threshold and they always wait two seconds and if you know, if it's any shorter, they get it, and if it's any longer, they don't get it. They, that's not, they don't do that. What they, they do is they seem to sort of mirror the distribution that, that we're imposing on them. So they will sometimes wait five seconds and then give up. And they'll sometimes wait just a half a second and give up. So, so their behavior is highly random, which is something we've been studying in particular in rats, actually, in order to understand why, why they're random what, what brain mechanisms are involved in the variability. So, so it's a bit of a different story. So we don't see any obvious effect of serotonin on that. It seems to you know, just shift the distribution a bit. And have you, sorry, have you also tried different distributions? I've been, no, <laughs> basically no. We've been, I've been, I tried for a long time to convince my, the person working on it to do different distributions because I think that will, will be super interesting, but we've since developed a different task and haven't been working as much on this one. This one is a little bit of a pain to teach animals, I have to admit, they, that it's, a, it's, actually some people might be wondering about this sort of thing. It's, you know, it's a, it's a month or so or a few weeks to train a task like this, whereas in the open field, the first day you go, you put them in and the, some people doing the five choice serial reaction time task, like we were talking, you know, three months. We're used to tasks like that, but the ones that we're using, this is, this is sort of as bad as it gets. We have a, the task I'm gonna show you next is, is very cool and much, and only takes a few weeks, to, three weeks or something to train. So uh, whatever, that's another disadvantage of being very, training these very complicated tasks is that, is that it, it takes a long time. <laughs> Um, I can, so I don't like to give these kind of answers, but I, it shouldn't much, but we haven't really, I, I don't think if, so if you overall gave them two microliters per trial instead of one microliter, but always two. Or, or maybe if they are really thirsty. Or if they're really thirsty. Yeah, there's an optimum in some sense. If they're too thirsty, they won't do it. If they're not thirsty enough, they won't do it. So there's a regime in which they're, the, you'll get the most trials and the most um, waiting. If you, if you look within a session, also, if, if you get toward the end of the session and they've gotten too much water, then they will also, their, their behavior can change. The details, you know, it's, it's, this is an important, it's important with water, these are obviously water restricted mice, it's important and it's not completely trivial to at least be consistent and um, yeah, I wish I had more systematic things to say about that but it, it is an issue. How is the stimulation spaced out? I mean, when is it delivered? Yeah, like how, it's, how, uh, how weird, often? Right, I, should, I don't think I, so, I don't even have a diagram. Well, we, so we stimulate from poke in to poke out on, uh, well, typically on half the trials. So, so it's random. On a, each trial, we flip a coin, and we stimulate or not as soon as they go into the waiting port. So technically, if they, if they wait longer, do they get more stimulation? OK. But you don't see an effect of that uh, when, when do they become more patient? I mean, do they? Like, do you think, like, because they wait longer, they are being more patient because of the stimulation? Or do you think? I think I, get, <laughs> I, I, think I know like what you're getting at, but like I'm not... Accumulated effect of the stimulation. Because they accumulated can, effect? Yeah. Like in this long-term thing that I was showing <laughs> over weeks, that kind of... 
or do no, you mean during no, one trial? Waiting. During trial. Uh, <laughs> so there's a... Okay, so the, the answer is slightly complicated. So um, in order to... So, so we, we have this model of direct effect and, and long-term effect. So my definition of direct effect is it's instantaneous and it doesn't really matter whether you started at the beginning or the end or how long it was, et cetera. So, so, so to first order, to first approximation, it, it is like that. But if you, if you try to, if you try to say, we, we've done protocols in which you would start stimulating at different times, not at the beginning, but later on, for example. Actually, we did a protocol in which we stimulate completely randomly that doesn't, with, with no relationship whatsoever to what the animals are doing in the task. So, so sometimes it would come on while they're wait, between trials, sometimes when the reward occurs, sometimes. And then we, we find the trials where it happens to come on during the middle of the waiting or right before, et cetera. And we tried to find out if there was some, if that was exactly the same as with the way we do it. And the answer is probably not exactly the same but it's really tricky to tease apart the, what, what, what's happening. So, so I do think in this task, so you might, what I thought you might be asking is, are there long-term effects, for example, or, or plasticity effects in this paradigm? And the answer is yes, we, 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 we think there are, but they're tr trickier to get at. So basically it seems like there is also in this task a kind of opposite compensatory effect uh, when the animals are not being stimulated. So we have a bunch of data on that, and we're, we're, the, the effects are a little bit harder to pin down, but there does seem to be. So I guess the, the tone coming on and the water dropping are very salient stimuli that the, rat, the mice can hear. Can you override responding to those by, incre by, by, by stimulating, and can you so stimulate those responses as well? Or? Stimulation doesn't affect the reaction time to the tone. So, so if it's been on, so in this case, it's on from here to poke out. So the tone, well, sometimes occurs after the poke out, but often occurs before the poke out. So if they respond, if they succeed in waiting until the tone, which they do in you know, something like 50% of the trials, then we can measure their response time to the tone. And they do respond to the tone. They're not oblivious and just responding randomly, and sometimes they win, sometimes they lose, they do respond, and that response, that reaction time is not affected by serotonin. Nor is the amount of time that they spend licking the water spout or um, you know, gather, gathering the reward. So you start to see that not all behaviors are affected when you start looking at this, this task. So this, get, this is gonna get back to the I'm going to show you this more clearly in the next task that I'll that I'll show, but 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 um, it does not seem to slow all types of behavior equally. It's particularly effective when the animals are waiting for this delayed tone, and less effective for these other types of responses. Okay, so does serotonin mediate? Uh, patience. So this is an idea, uh, an old idea. This is a nice review. Uh, for any theory you want of serotonin, there's an old review that proposed something fairly similar. In this case, it was Subrier Behavioral and Brain Sciences paper from 1986, uh, where he proposed the serotonin neurons are involved in enabling the organism to arrange or tolerate delay before acting, which so far fairly consistent with, with, well, especially consistent with this line, of this, this task, and even you could say perhaps with the open field, and, and there's obviously a variety of other data that he's summarized in this paper, and the idea from, from Kenji Doya's lab is fairly similar. Serotonin system is involved in waiting to avoid punishment for future punishments and waiting to obtain reward uh, for future rewards. So, um, so actually, I get. So I guess I want to contrast this with something which I don't have, which I don't have a slide for, but is a, another. I guess Soubrier's theory is sometimes referred to as a behavioral inhibition theory, 
And so sometimes if you think about d dopamine as energizing or motivating, you could think of serotonin as, as de-energizing or demotivating, but let's just say de uh, Inhibiting. So is serotonin just inhibiting behavior? So when the animal's in the open field, it's less likely to run or, initiate or slower in running. When it's waiting, it's less likely to move, so it's just waiting. So, so far, inhibition and patience are not really distinct. Patience means not doing much. That's basically inhibiting behavior. But that, those two things in principle can be distinguished. So this is, so, uh, a student and a postdoc in the lab, uh, at some point, unbeknownst to me, decided to try a different task, and it turned out to be a really good idea. It wasn't mine, but I'm nevertheless happy to present it. So they, th they were thinking about foraging, and some of you know there's a fair bit of work um, on, in more of a behavioral ecology setting on foraging. Uh, it's a little bit distinct from psychology literature that we're generally familiar with, but you, they think of it like animals enter patches of food, and in, when they're in a patch, then they can get food or whatever resource they need. Per, uh, it can be probabilistic or uh, random, but it, it, it can be not random. And then they have to decide basically when to leave a given patch and go off to get to another patch. So some, some, sometimes this involves what's called an explore-exploit trade-off, so exploiting the current resource versus, versus exploring for another. Um, so, so there's some theory that, that has been done to describe how animals ought to do this, and it's a fairly nice uh, uh, kind of paradigm in, in which to work. So, so uh, Iran, uh, a postdoc in the lab, and actually Druba, who was a master's student technician, um, started working on a paradigm that looks like this. So the animal runs between two nose pokes where it can get water. So these are the patches. And we detect where it is using a video camera. And then we put these barriers to make it a little bit harder to get between patches. So this is the animal's travel cost, if you will. And we could remove them or place them. We're actually now doing it with a box that looks a little bit more like a a simpler box with just two ports on the same wall. It doesn't really matter the details. So in a typical foraging bout, the animal goes to the ROI here, and then it pokes into the port. And the way we do this is each poke is either rewarded or not rewarded. And we then set a schedule that says after a certain amount of time or pokes or, or with some graded uh, change, the port is depleted. So it's like a patch of food that has been consumed. And so for example, this, in this bout, the animal makes one poke and gets nothing because it's probabilistic. I think it's uh, one third. Oh no, this, in this schedule, it starts at 70% or 100%, then it drops exponentially down to zero. That, that's how we did it. So that each poke, there's less and less chance of getting a reward. So in here, he got, got water, and then the poke is a little longer because he's drinking, and here he also got water, it's a little bit longer, and then failure, 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 and at this point, he, he gives up. So you could think of this as a little bit like a probabilistic reversal task because the animal has to basically decide that the state of the poke, the state of this port has reversed, has changed. It used to be good, and now it's no longer so good. Because it's probabilistic, the reward delivery, you know, sometimes you shouldn't switch just because you failed to get uh, 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 water, like in this poke. And in other times, you have to eventually decide to leave. Anyway, there are a lot of parameters you can actually play with, and I don't have time to get into all of that, but this is, this is sort of what the, what the behavior looks like. What's the, what's the key is you can also think of this as a waiting task. So the animals are. Um, are, are actively poking, but they are waiting or persisting for some amount of time. And the question was, does serotonin stimulation inhibit their behavior in the sense, does it, actually, does it make them poke less or does it make them persist longer? So st strictly speaking, behavioral inhibition should not, allow, should not produce uh, 
an increased persistence in poking, that wouldn't be, strictly speaking, behavioral inhibition. It would be more like patience. Um, so if, if we follow strictly behavioral inhibition, we, we would expect to see not, not we, we should not expect to see this prolonged. But if you think of this as patience, then this is very much like how patient are you to, to stay here, like how many times, especially in the last, after the last reward, there's always some period in which the animal is exhibiting some sort of patience to keep poking. So remember, he's not waiting. He's act, he has to actively poke each time, but he's getting nothing. So it's very much like active waiting. What kind of signal do you have that the animal has stopped exploiting the patch? So he'll just leave, he'll stop poking and leave. Well, sometimes they, they may just not be poking but haven't yet left. But we have both the video and then the poke itself. So um, I should ask you, what did you think happened? But I think probably most of you guessed that the, what happens is the animals poke more persistently rather than uh, less. So like in the waiting task, we stimulate on 50% of the trials from the, whenever they start poking till whenever they end, um, which is sometimes as much as five or 10 seconds. It's a little bit longer than in the waiting task. And we have a, a reliable, say, relatively small, I, I love to see 50% effects. It's not a 50% effect, but a reliable effect where um, mice that are photostimulated uh, leave, uh, leave less quickly. They persist in exploiting this resource um, and, and not giving up. It just affects what? Say food and they, they're more hungry, and that's why they run for a water for a long time. I mean, like, if you, you know, if we you have done done uh, So, what's the right thing for the animal to do here? So, what's the right amount of serotonin or the right amount of patience? It depends on exactly the uh, costs and benefits in the task. So, so if the probability of, of being, de or if the rate of being depleted or the probability of being depleted is fast, then you should give up sooner. If the probability is, is longer, you should wait longer. If the probability is lower, it, it gets harder to tell whether it is or isn't, it has, whether the state has changed. Uh, if the travel cost is higher, then you should stay longer. So if you, if it, you have to spend a week getting to the next port, then you should be really sure that this port is bad before you leave. So that's what makes this task interesting. You can play with all these parameters, and we can see whether serotonin affects the travel cost or not, or whether it affects the sensitivity to the probabilities. There's a lot of things. I don't, I don't actually have, I, I think that's, oh, I only want to show one more slide on this task. We're in the middle of, of these kind of experiments, but we can dissociate things like an effect on hunger from an effect on decision making because it, it's not, we can look at the overall rate of rewards and is that, how does that interact with stimulation as opposed to the shift between ex exploration and exploitation. So, so we, we like this task, I guess, back and then front. So exploitation and exploration is also, I think, an important um, or is associated with the Cirelli dysfunction. Um, and there is also a connection, I think, between the rat pain and the LC. So how are you sure this is actually not indirectly LC activation? I'm not sure at all. No, I think, I think those kind of interactions uh, whether it's dopamine, serotonin, dopamine, it's a big, there's a big interaction. Locus aureus, there's, a, there's an interaction, generally inhibitory or thought to be inhibitory. So I'm certainly not sure where this effect is, is acting. It could be in part through LC, it could be direct. Yeah, I'm, I, so I, I'm, 
as I mentioned at the beginning, we would love to understand exactly which circuits are being affected, and we're just jumping to the behavioral level, but it has occurred to me sometimes that, oh, maybe some of these effects are, are from particularly locus aureus because now you start to see the sort of effects we see, some of them start to resemble some of the effects of norepinephrine. It's also been implicated in randomness of behavior and switching between random and, um, and model-based strategies, things like this. So it could be that they directly talk to each other. It could be that they have similar targets and they, they interact at the target level. Yeah. <laughs> Blocking, uh, we haven't done, we haven't done the pharmacology. We've done only a little. We started to do pharmacology on this with serotonin receptors. We haven't done any uh, norepinephrine. If you're interested, we we could we could try to come up with something. Um, so I don't know if I'm interpreting that distribution right. Are they nose poking less in those during that stimulation? More. So the, the length of nose poke is, is increased. So ah. they, actually, they actually enter the nose poke less? Or? Well, we're measure, so we're just measuring. Um, what I'm showing you is just a measure of how, uh, when they leave. So it's a rate of leaving. So, th so this is the pokes per trial. So they make more pokes per trial. This is the simplest way to measure it. So they're poking more when they're photostimulated. So it's, right. not, it's not a similar kind of, you don't see a freezing or slowing no. down effect in mean, this kind of... Practice. Exactly. So, so sorry if, that, if I didn't make that clear enough, because that's the key point. So they are not showing behavioral inhibition. They're showing, if you just think of it as pokes, like they're showing more pokes. They're poking more often in a given period of time or in the whole session when they're being stimulated compared to when they're not. So I think we can, if, if the behavioral inhibition theory means anything, I think that this experiment rules out the behavioral inhibition theory. If you can always twist it and say, oh, I didn't really mean behavioral inhibition, I meant the inhibition of certain kinds of behaviors. In that case, of course, that, that is still consistent with this, and you could never disprove that, that idea, right? <laughs> yeah. You Right, so, that, so that's a little bit, so, so thinking of it, is this like a reversal task, and if so, is that all consistent? Unfortunately, if it's a reversal task, it's, it's in the wrong direction. So what we think serotonin does in a reversal task is make it easier for them to reverse, and this seems to make it harder for them to reverse if you think of a single bout of foraging as you know, one stretch of rewards on a particular location, and going to the other location is like a switch, a reversal, it's going in the wrong direction. And we've done, I'll show you that experiment, we've done the reversal task, and well, we've done it with dreads blocking serotonin, not with stimulation, but in our hands we also see that serotonin seems to be promoting reversal in a traditional reversal task. So, yes. <laughs> But now, but I think that there's a, I think there's a way of, I think there's a way of understanding that, but it, that let's, this is getting into stuff that I don't have the slides for, so let's talk about it. I can tell you what I think at the end. Um, I, can't, I can't remember who was first, but let's say. Uh, does this persist through extinction? Does it what? Persist through extinction. So if you no longer reward them, they still poke more when you simulate. If you no longer give them a reward and you just put them in the You trash. mean like at the middle we just stop giving anything? Precisely, and you still simulate. I don't know what happens in that case. What, why, what would you think? Oh, just to see if it is just they're there and they don't want to move somewhere else and there's nothing else to do but to poke. Um, hmm. Yeah, I'm not, I don't know. It's, a, it's an interesting question. And then, did you have a question? Yes, I um, What do you think about using the um, receptor in vitro here instead of uh, serotonin receptor in vitro? Yeah, so we've done some what of that. After? What do you think? <laughs> what do you guys think? Yes, we've done some of that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
what's the answer? Ah. Um, so if you, so you have this uh, 5-HT2C, 2A um, antagonism. And if we do 5-HT2C antagonist and 5-HT2A antagonist, they have the opposite effects in this task. And they're in the direction that would be expected based on pr previous work, from, from uh, particular from Trevor's lab. And so the two, so I always, gonna, I always have to think this through to make sure I don't say it the wrong way, but I believe it's that the 2C antagonist has the opposite effect. I'm gonna look at Trevor to, make to see if he can correct me. The, th the 2C antagonist has the opposite effect of the stimulation, so we think, so the 2C agonism, 2C activation has the same effect as the, um, as the optogenetic stimulation. So it makes them more patient. Actually, in pr so one I'm not gonna show, because this is a, actually an older version of the experiment, we can model this task using a really simple model, which effectively has one parameter that, that is their it's if you want, it's like their patients, it's like their threshold for leaving, and the drugs and the stimulation all affect this parameter, this single parameter, in a fairly consistent or a fairly simple way. So it, it does seem like if you can explain them as if they have a knob for how patient they are or what their threshold for leaving is. And um, yeah, so we're hoping to use, to, to use this to link the optogenetic effect to the pharmacological effects. So, but we're not that far, we're not, we haven't published it, we're not, complete, we're not there completely. Okay, let me, okay, so now I said before, I've said in passing that the thing is context dependent, and this is a, a good example of that. So in this, kind of a control condition, we, in the same foraging task, we stimulate when they're, um, this is essentially when they're in the other port, here is when they're traveling between, uh, they're basically traveling from one side to the other. So if you, the graph isn't so great. So they go from here to here, we stimulate during this period so as soon as they leave the ROI, we turn it on, and then we, we turn it off here. And we see absolutely nothing. And we've, we've done a similar, two sort of similar experiments. We tested them on a rotor rod, where the accelerating rotor rod, where the animal has to, has to keep moving in order to stay from, prevent from falling. And in another task, which essentially is them running back and forth to get water in a corridor, and in, in those three types of, of, of conditions, we don't see any slowing of movement. So in the open field, even if they're going quite quickly, they're, they're, whatever they're doing is affected. <laughs> but in, when they're going for rewards, when it's very, or this is my interpretation, when they're motivated strongly to, to act, to run across to get the reward, then they're not affected. So, so so, so this context dependency and the fact, I think, so there's a, re so let me summarize and then I'll take the qu questions uh, if, on the last bit. So, so serotonin causes a rapid and transient bias that we would have to say is, is not an inhibition of movement, but is some kind of bias in action selection or decision making, in addition to perhaps as a, an effect on movement. The, these effects are context dependent and they can be expressed in different ways in different contexts. So we see slowing in, of locomotion in the open field. We see no effect when the animals are engaged in running for a reward, I should, I should add. We see inhibition of leaving in a waiting task and we see increased poking in a foraging task. So it's, it's I think, quite clear from this that, that we can't think of this as a motor effect that, that it, we, we need to think of it as a motivational effect, a cognitive effect, a decision-making effect, or something at a little bit higher level. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense uh, to say uh, uh, that, that things are just, just slowed or, or sped. 
um, we, you know, so that's what we're after is to come up with a more coherent theory that can explain why you see different effects in different contexts. Um, I just want to understand your, your foraging task, how the patches deplete, just, just to make sure that I understand how it works. So, so do, do they actually, do, is, there, is there a rate at which they deplete, or is it just purely probabilistic and then at one point the reward is no longer given? Because that's not, I guess, traditional foraging. And then, because usually there's an optimal time, right, at which you should leave a patch. And how does that affect your understanding or how you model that? Yes, in this great time? question. Um, so, in that version that I showed you, it was overly complicated, perhaps. So there were three different initial reward probabilities. So in any particular visit, they would get either, it would either start at 100, 75, or 50, I believe. And then regardless, it would deplete, or the probability would go down exponentially. So to do, so for, to, for the mouse to do that optimally, it, 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 it or yeah, truly optimally, he would have to keep the conditional um, probabilities of which initial probability he might have gotten and update it. And it, it's, it, you can write it down, but it's pretty, we thought it's pretty unlikely that the mouse actually doing that. And it wouldn't be that different from a much simpler rule like, you know, stay on average 20 trials or whatever. <laughs> Uh, so we didn't even, so I couldn't even convince the, I have, a, <laughs> I have a student whose background is math, and I, I was, he would say things like this, and I'd say, yeah, so, show, so why don't we write down the optimal solution? And he'd say, well, you know, I could do that, but it's sort of, uh. so they switched, so they came up with, so, in, so instead they came up with a better task. So, they, the, so we said, okay, let's just do a task where we know what the optimal solution is instead of trying to come up ex post facto with the, the, the solution for a bad task. And so the new task, it's more like the second thing you said. So now the probability starts at an initial constant value, say 0.3, and then with a certain probability, it flips to depleted. So it's like a change point detection task, if you want. So say it's 0.3, and then it goes to zero, then the animal has to go to the other side in order to have anything happen or it could start at 0.9 and flip to zero. So there's two parameters that determine the, the, the whole thing. How, what's the initial probability and what's the probability of flipping? It's, it's, it could be high initially and then go quickly down and give the same average reward as one that starts low and stays longer. And that, the model for this is, a, is, a, is an accumulator with a reset. So every time you get a reward, you know that you're, you're still in an active port. And every time you don't get a reward, you know it's more likely that your port is depleted. And it's a very, very, very nice, simple model. And well, anyway, we, that, <laughs> without showing, since I don't have slides, I, I shouldn't get too far into it. But that's the, that's the advantage of that, that, that it has a nice model. So if the animal gave up earlier than the, that you expected, like it gave up at like 0.5 instead of 0.3 or even zero, and went to another uh, reward port, is the, the ratio of getting a bigger a reward is higher always than the, the other one? I mean, the reward port? In this version, in the version I'm showing, yes. Because when he goes, in this version, the, the, the port always starts as high, it always starts high, well, no, not even, because I guess it, it depends on when he leaves and which schedule oh, so he gets. So it's complicated. It, in the new version, then when a port is, is really depleted, it's really zero. And so is, if he hasn't made a mistake and left too early, then he's always going to get a, a better chance at the next port. If he left too early, then he will never get anything, and then he'll have to actually go back again to the, to the original port. The, you can imagine, you, so you can play different games with different schedules. You could imagine, like, um, you, you can imagine all sorts of different scenarios with different optimal solutions. One thing that you, I forgot to say when I introduced this task is it's quite easy to train mice to do this. So, so they, they, they seem to be built to do this kind of thing. It's only, you could probably 
you can, you can train them to do a basic version in, in like a few days, it, it may be a week. So unlike the waiting task where they really just have to sit there doing nothing while they're not getting anything, they don't like that. Here, they're always getting rewards while they're doing the, the thing. And it's just a question of, are they doing it right? Are they waiting long enough or not? It, 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 it's, it's, so it seems, to be, it seems to be natural. So we like that. We like it because it's easier to do experimentally and because it seems to be more ethologically relevant if we don't have to train them for weeks and months. We seem to be getting a bit into what they are nor normally doing. So it's, it's, it seems like there could be no benefit of switching. There could be what? No benefit of switching to another world. They, they always need to switch because the, 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 in all of these tasks, any particular port will always get depleted at some point. So they are always switching back and forth, you know, 50, 100, depending on how long the session is, they always have to switch. And, and there is an optimal, there's waiting too long and there's waiting too, too short. So unlike in the waiting task where really optimally they should just always wait, it's kind of, there's no, at least if you only think about the rewards, the only right thing to do is always wait for the tone. In this task, the right thing to do is switch, but the question is when. So they always should switch at, a, at the right point, and they can be either too fast or too slow, right? So you could ask, does serotonin make them more optimal? The effects are close to, you know, are small enough that it's not that easy in that, what I showed you to say, whether they're getting more rewards or not. But you can ask that kind of question. You can ask, ask what's the right thing for them to do. That, that's, a nice, that's a nice feature of this, this type of task. Oh, wait, sorry, did you manipulate the cost of travel as well? Yeah. Did you, did you add, add, like, add additional walls? Or? Yeah. Okay. Yep. And do, do you see an effect of doing that? Do they take that into consideration? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and, it, and in this simple version of the task, that there's only one thing to change, which is, how, what's your, basically it's like, what is your threshold for leaving? How many misses do you need to get before you give up? And if you increase the travel cost, then you should be more willing to take some risk that you're, you're, you're foraging at a depleted port because the cost of going to the other one to check is, is higher. So you see that particularly when there's a low probability of where it's difficult to tell whether the thing has, has actually depleted or not. Stimulate in during travel, and it's like a high, high stake travel. Do you see an effect of that? Do you, if you increase the travel costs, do you then see an overriding of the serotonin system, which then will slow them down, or they still travel at the same speeds? Well, we should, okay, we probably need to do it in that task, but in this task, you don't see anything. And if it was affecting we, should pr we probably need to redo it. We haven't done it yet in, that, in this task where we have a, mo a good model. In this task where we don't have a model, you would still s expect to see some effect of travel, travel cost, but maybe we missed it, but there wasn't, that, that didn't seem to be the case. Um, do you think that there might be some kind of uh, interaction between serotonin and perception of time? Because, mm. um, for, um, to be fair, so the, the foraging stuff that you've just spoken about with the repeated nose poking might, might be a little bit different. But especially like your earlier study kind of was reminiscent of this idea of being more patient perhaps means actually perceiving that time has gone more slowly. Mm. Is that the right for direction? Yes, that is, yeah. Um, so I don't know, is there any, like, I don't know, do you have any insight on that? Um, and whether that might be reflected. I don't the foraging is a little bit different again because they're discrete actions. But again, it might be the case that they are perceiving that less time has passed than actually has. I think this data is, is consistent with that interpretation. So, they, so serotonin stimulation actually, um, actually it's kind of strange, if I remember correctly, has the same effect as dopamine stimulation with, that, with respect to that, which is a bit strange. But, uh, it, it's as if they think that less time and or effort has, has been used than actually has, right? So, so it's as if, oh, that wasn't so, I haven't been waiting so long, uh, or I haven't expended so much effort poking, but say if it's time, oh, my, oh, it's time to go, I check my internal clock and it says, oh, no, I still have time. 
and in fact, the real clock time has passed more quickly than, than the animal's internal clock time. So that could explain this type. That, that would be more like patience, right? It's like the animal just doesn't realize how much time is, 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 is passing. And you, so you, because you were, you were at Champlain Mo and you visited Joe's, so we actually, they have a task which involves interval. So we actually did that experiment in their task using serotonin stimulation in their task. And we did get, we did get that, the, the expected result more or less. But the postdoc who's doing that, who's the second author on their science paper, Bass, yeah, uh, didn't like the result or didn't, I don't know, didn't follow the result through. <laughs> Just wondering the correlation when you increased in the stimulation So what if you decreased in the value of the reward not to be happening? So because of the, you are talking about the context of the state, so maybe it can change also the, the, the response of the So you're thinking of an experiment in which in one session, instead of getting one microliter per trial, they got two? Or because, so in those situations, generally, you, we don't, you don't see any difference in the behavior of a mouse doing, or at the trial level. They may do less trials overall because eventually they want about, uh, whatever, 10 microliters, uh, I don't know, the, the, the numbers, 50 microliters, 100 microliters, whatever they want, um, an ML, they, they get that and then they're kind of done for the day. So you'd see effects at that level, but you wouldn't typically, there's no way to tell by looking at a mouse in a cage whether it's working for a small drop or a big drop because their context, that is the context. It's, I work for water at this moment, this is what's available, so with, Across tri within a trial, you, you could double the amount of reward and they won't wait any longer. If, however, within a session, you switched from one to two at some point, or if you had one port with one and another port with two, then you can start to see effects. Like, I guess Russian talked about some experiments in which if, if you're working for a big payoff on this particular trial, that may change your behavior on this particular trial relative to the last trial where it was a smaller reward, right? But if you paid the subjects, I don't know, maybe with humans it would get complicated, but if you just tripled the amount of money that you get for every trial in a given, uh, in the experiment, that would be less easy to tell what the effect was than if you, you do it trial by trial. So, so we could try, we haven't done those kind of experiments, but. I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule it out, but I'm not, I guess I don't completely understand your prediction, so, but ha, ha, we can talk, uh, we can talk afterwards. I think it's almost 12, isn't it? It's so, 12, I'm, three minutes to 12. so I'm not going to do, so I'm clearly not going to do the second part of the talk. I'll tell you, I have a question for you, in general, teaching, which is, um, you know, you're talking about the That's a good question. Great question. Um, so, how much time? How much time do I have to wrap up? Because I want to wrap up as well as answering the question. But okay, that that's plenty. That's more than enough. Um, so we our experience. So there's there's a couple of uh, there's, there's actually more than a couple. But the, the sort of familiar methods are uh, there are optogenetic tools that inhibit, and there are pharmacogenetic tools that inhibit. Pharmacogenetics, it's cool, but it's not all that different from pharmacology in that the time scale is, is quite long. So you could be perhaps more confident that you shut down the entire system or, or selectively, but 
Um, but I, it, it, I don't, you don't really learn a whole lot more than you, than you do with, 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 um, with drugs in my, in my mind. For example, if you have the system shut down during the entire, say, 10 minutes or 30 minutes of the task, then some of the effects could be due to interactions during the reward, reinforcement interactions, and, other, or, uh, and others could be, say, direct effects on decision making, and you'll never be able to distinguish those. If you had an optogenetic tool, you, you, could, you could silence during the decision period or during the reward period and, and, and tease those apart. So we'd like to, We've done pharmacogenetic experiments on the reversal task. We're very happy that they worked. Um, pharmacogenetic seems to work really well in general, or, uh, well, this is like the lore, like what I understand, what our experience is and what I understand is it generally works. It actually seems to be able to suppress, release quite well. It gets through the axons. I don't know entirely why, but it, it works well. We've, of course, tried a few times, I don't know how many times, but we've tried a number of different optogenetic techniques, and there are a lot of them, and they, they at least for a while, were improving all the time. There's halorhodopsin, one, two, three, there's art, archeo, ar arch, uh, et cetera, et cetera, there's others. There's, there's, there seemed for a while to always be a new one every time you checked. And in our hands, they've not, none of them have really worked. Uh, in, in the serotonin system. But now, that, don't take that like we screened everything and it doesn't work, but the kinds of, we, we've seen a lot of garbage when we had gotten the chenorhodopsin to work well and the others did not. One, th one th but there's always a new one, so there's always the possibility that for whatever reason, the, the one that we didn't try is the, the miracle. So there's, there's one that, whose name escapes me, which I'll look up for someone that's fairly new, which uses blue light, which is nice because Chenrodopsin also uses blue light. And for me, the light, light is an important confound. So if I have to switch my yellow laser to a blue laser, I can't really directly compare them because the yellow laser penetrates tissue differently, is seen differently by the animal, et cetera. Um, so many of the Roda halo and arch are in the green or yellow. Um, but anyway, so that's so that so there, the tools exist, but but they don't. You really kind of have to work out for each, or at least if you have a negative result or a con, or some kind of control failure, it doesn't tell you much of anything. But anyway, with the existing tools that you, you've got to work, and you know, well done for that. Pharmacogenetics, yeah, chemogenetics, you predict the opposite result. Yeah, we, we haven't done it in this task now. Yes, or at least it would, it would be, well, hopefully it would be not, it would be not very, uh, it would not be very interesting, but if it turned out it didn't work, then it would be interesting, <laughs> right? Is that what you mean? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it would be ordinary if you didn't yes. show the opposite result once you've got this. Um, I think we, I think it, I, I would, what I would like to be able to do is the optogenetics, but failing that, I would like to do the, we, we should show the, at least the chemogenetics. But we've also been pursuing this strategy of combining optogenetics and pharmacology in the same task, even in the same, even together. So we could do, we could do antagonists together with optogenetic stimulation, for example, try to understand which receptor was primarily being activated. We, we have the ability in principle to sort out longer term versus shorter term effects. We don't really know which receptors mediate short or long-term effects or whether they're more sensitive to transients or not. Um, you know, there are some data on affinities and so on, binding constants, but those don't really, not very clear. I was at least, I was surprised that there isn't any, you know, is the 5-HT2C receptor more sensitive to transients or, than the 2A or vice versa? <laughs> okay, so now let me, let me wrap up. So, um, so I basically, I'm going to skip basically this second half, which is another. Is this is a paper? It's published in January in eLife. We we basically tested 
uh, a fairly similar paradigm to what the Schultz, Schultz et al. were interested in this opponency. Uh, we, we were motivated by the reversal learning paradigms that you, you heard about already. We did dreads. We showed that dreads slow, slow learning of negative reversals, but don't affect positive reversals. We then did photometry. We used two colors. To, we'd use uh, two colors simultaneously, which is super important and works much better than the isospecific point for those who are into the details. So be careful with, <laughs> with this stuff. Serotonin is, is bad for movement artifacts, much worse than dopamine. And then this is all published anyway. So we do deterministic reversals. We have negative surprise and positive surprise. We see CS responses are identical between serotonin and dopamine, virtually identical. Um, but this, this is the most interesting point of the study for me. We found that the dynamics of CS response learning are much slower in serotonin neurons than dopamine neurons. Serotonin neurons learn the reversal with the time scale that's um, almost an order of magnitude slower than the dopamine, much slower. No one has appreciated this that I know of previously. That's why I think it's a more interesting point. And it actually calls to mind an old theory, oh, I forgot the year, Solomon Corbett, 1974, the um, opponent process theory of emotion, where there's a positive and a negative, or a, 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 a primary and a, and a secondary effect and if they have different time scales, particularly if the secondary effect is slower, like the serotonin, then you get this asymmetry of uh, response. We could talk about this. This is their Salman Corbett. So you have the first component that's fast and the second component that's slow. In their model, this is a derivative of this. And when you add them up, you get even if they were to balance out eventually, you'd get a, a, a positive effect and a negative effect um, because of the differences in time scales. So, um, uh, and then we look at the US responses and we see basically serotonin neurons uh, respond to both positive surprises and negative surprises in the same way, whereas dopamine neurons respond to positive surprises in one way and negative surprises in the other way. And so dopamine neurons are appropriate to drive, to, to drive learning in a particular direction to reduce errors, where serotonin neurons seem to be inappropriate to drive learning in a particular direction because they respond to good or bad. But they are like norepinephrine or, or acetylcholine perhaps, appropriate to report, report just surprise in general or uncertainty and therefore to drive learning as has been proposed for norepinephrine. Uh, there's a, a rub in this, which is that punishments drive serotonin neurons regardless of whether they're surprising or not. And we think this might have to do with thinking about serotonin as a control error rather than a prediction error. And this comes from thinking about studies, for example, well, from Russians. Uh, studies, for example, but also from the work of Mayer, who shows that uh, DRN, caudal DRN, is particularly sensitive to a control ability. That's like whether the animal can turn off a shock as opposed to whether it can predict. And um, yeah, so that so overall, I think this is the overall summary. Uh, overall. Um, Endogenous firing reports surprising events, which may be appropriate to enhance plasticity and suppress learned responses in the face of uncertainty. And activation of serotonin neurons biases decision making, um, which can, uh, I, so here's a, here's a bit of a proposal. So this is going beyond what I showed in the first part, but I showed that it biases decision making. We can think of two ways that this could facilitate cognitive flexibility. Th that is one, by suppressing, uh, responding to, let's say, erroneous or maladapt 
adaptive expectations. So patience, in a way, is not acting on maladaptive expectations for the immediate future. So that's a kind of a, an inhibition or a bias in behavior uh, that, that's a way of, of thinking about it. And second, uh, facilitating an adaptation when things change. So this is learning, or, or reversal learning in particular. Um, it's a lot. I don't, wouldn't claim that this all makes, adds up to make perfect sense, but I want to emphasize direct and long-term effects, and there's clearly long-term effects of serotonin stimulation, and that starts making, I think that makes a big difference in how you start thinking about what does an SSRI do, for example, or, or what does uh, uh, LSD do even. So we come back to the, to the enigma it's, it's actually quite clear in the literature that serotonin has an effect on plasticity. This is ocular dominance plasticity studies from um, Maya Vettencourt, um, Maffe uh, group. Fluoxetine increases plasticity here. This is a slice study from Kirkwood, I believe. Um, dopamine, serotonin have effects on LTB, LTD, LTP. So, so a theory that was proposed a few years ago uh, is that serotonin reuptake inhibitors don't bias behavior toward improved mood. They simply affect the rate of change of mood, let's say, or the rate of adaptation to the environment. So low serotonin levels, low neuroplasticity, you get stuck in a depressed condition or in a healthy condition, there's a barrier. High serotonin levels, more plasticity, you can get undepressed or depressed again. So I think they, they talk about this as like a double-edged sword. You could actually have an SSRI and go from healthy to depressed as well as the other way around. Very different thinking about how to explain the effect of SSRIs and actually fairly consistent with, with much of what we know about them. So it's kind of shocking that we don't think of this much at all, or I think maybe clinicians can tell me otherwise, but this obviously would, would help to explain why they take so long to act because as, as they cause, would enhance plasticity, they would naturally take some time. Uh, I'm going to totally skip that. So just to, uh, to end, um, the Iran is a postdoc who invented the foraging task, a really fantastic postdoc. Sara uh, was a student who, who did the photometry together with Iran, and Patricia is a student who did the um, open field work. Um, and then a lot of other people contributed various points along the way, and Peter, Diane is actually a collaborator on, on some of this work, despite the fact that, which I think, actually, which, which may, uh, <laughs> the fact that he's willing to, to deal with data that's contradictory to his proposals is a, is a sign of a good theorist, um, although he's, all, he's certainly not, not someone who gives up uh, immediately. <laughs> his, his patience level are, is high, <laughs> but anyway, he, he's he's been influential. So thank thanks a lot for uh, thanks a lot for listening. All the questions. <laughs>